Hi, everyone. We're going to take a couple of uh, seconds here while people are still trickling in, and then we're going to get started. Okay, good evening, everyone. We're going to get started here. Um, I'm Adelina Iftene. I'm a professor at the Schulich School of Law and uh, at the coordinator of the Criminal Justice Coalition. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the last uh, event of the Criminal Justice Speaker Series. And we are going to, to end the series with a very topical subject. Um, we are going to be talking about the opioid crisis and the safe supply. Um, we have three wonderful speakers that will be talking about their work on this issue, both uh, their work separately and their work together. Um, first, we have uh, Matt Bond, who uh, is the program coordinator with the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs. Um, and he will be in conversation with uh, my colleagues, Professor Matt Herder, who is also the um, director of the Health Law Institute uh, at Dalhousie as well as uh, Professor Sheila Waldman, who is also with the House Law Institute at Dalhousie, and she is a founding fellow with, with the McCacken Institute for Public Policy. Before I turn it to Matt, uh, I just a couple of things that I want to note. Uh, first of all, you're going to see at the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A box, so I do want to invite you to use it and to type your questions there during the talk. Um, and I will come back at the, at the end after uh, our three speakers who have uh, presented and filtered the questions for them. Also, do note that the um, this session is recorded. Um, you're not going to appear on the recording, uh, only the speakers will, but you will be able to watch it um, afterwards uh, on the Shuli Schools of Law's YouTube channel. Okay, and with that said, um, I'm going to welcome our three speakers and turn it to Matt. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Matthew Bond. I'm the program coordinator with the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs. And I just finished my slide deck, so I was hoping Adelina would uh, talk a little bit longer, but we're good to go. So uh, let me share my screen here um and put us in slideshow mode play from the beginning so um as i said my name is matthew bond um uh, you know i am someone who uses drugs pretty much daily my drug of choice is fentanyl and i like to think that i'm a survivor of a overdose crisis because uh, I've known way too many people that haven't made it out alive, um, you know, and I actually carry a lot of uh, grief and trauma over that because sometimes I think that, uh, you know, why, why not me and, and why them, but um, trying to change that energy into to something positive. Um, you know, and last year I had an opportunity, I was doing a lot of freelance writing and I called my friend in Montreal and I said, um, you know, can we write a letter to an editor to like a medical journal? And he's like, sure. And I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. And I knew he was really, really smart and uh, really knew how to kind of navigate that system. And I had no idea. 
and, and a fun little fact, the first draft of this was actually written um, while I was on mushrooms. So <laughs> just keep that in mind if you ever read this paper. A couple of my national and international affiliations. I was uh, pretty much affiliated with every local harm reduction organization that you could imagine from Direction 180, Mainline, Hand Up, Halifix, um, you name it. I probably have worked there if it's over the cold, if it's Coverdale. Um, but now I've been doing more national and international work. So I am the program coordinator with the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs. We do a lot of drug policy work and uh, we're based at Oda Dartmouth. I'm a national board member for the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy. We actually have a Dalhousie chapter, so I encourage you to either reach out to me or reach out to some of the chapter uh the chapter coordinator with the national board or i can put you in contact with the two local chapter leaders and um revive this uh this chapter um i'm one of the leads in this organic group that kind of uh happened really because of covid which was uh, the pan-american network of drug user activists and we're actually looking at creating a Delphi survey right now to look at um, people in North America, Central America, Latin America, and South America, uh, people who use drugs and see what are the real issues uh, that people who use drugs are facing and experiencing. And I recently took on an international board seat for the International Network on Health and Hepatitis and Substance User, INSU, which is out of uh, Australia. I'm, I'm hoping I get to go there this year. Um, I know Matt's going to shake his head, but maybe Farmer will pay for me, but we'll go to the next slide. So before I do uh, the rest of the presentation, I'd like to... Uh, do a uh, Nova Scotia land acknowledgement and just an acknowledgement for the acknowledgement is that this is just one very small piece of what we need to do to really build some meaningful and, um, you know, meaningful relationship building with uh, the Indigenous tribes of Turtle Island. So I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting today for Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the British Treaty, the, but covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and the Wulas Tuiki signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and the Wulas Tuiki title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Honoring this treaty re uh, relationship through land acknowledgement is just one of the many steps that can be taken towards reconciliation as outlined in the 94 calls to action issued by the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission of Canada in 2015. And this is my my favorite um, paragraph to it, but, and I think, you know, we all really have to, you know, think about what we're going to do to really um, become more self-aware with our cultural competency. So every individual and every institution has a role to play in making the needed changes to dismantle systemic racism and oppression against Black and Indigenous people in Canada. We think one action that anyone can take is raising your own cultural awareness, learning about other cultures, asking questions, reading, listening, becoming more self-aware. It may seem simple enough, but we're, we're going into a process um, and we have to be prepared to be humbled at any point because we're entering a lifelong journey and we will make mistakes. As long as we keep an open mind and open heart, 
through this acknowledgement and the harm reduction philosophy, we commit ourselves to this lifelong work in creating effective change within our society. So um, I don't think I read uh, the, the title of my uh, publication, but I have it right here, so I will read it because this word is not a, a really well-known word, even among some of uh, some people that you would think I that I would thought may have known it. But uh, unless you're an epidemiologist or uh, whatnot, you may have not heard it. So the publication was called. Addressing the syndemic of HIV, hepatitis C, overdose, and COVID-19 among people who use drugs, the potential roles for decriminalization and safe supply. So, you know, when we're talking about the pandemic, an epidemic, an overdose crisis, a housing crisis, public health emergencies, for people who use drugs and a lot of other marginalized and racialized uh, communities, what we're really talking about is a syndemic. You know, and a syndemic is when two or more um, social or health diseases or issues uh, negatively impact each other to uh, worsen the, the, the disease trajectory outcome for each um, illness. You know, a great example is if somebody is homeless and they have HIV and their uh, hepatitis C co-infection, there's a good chance that they may not be adhering to their um, hepatitis C medication or even their anti-retroviral anti medication for their HIV. So, you know, that's really going to impact their co-infection. So I'd like to think that uh, of this crisis as a syndemic so you'll you'll see this word and, and i'll kind of explain it a little bit more as we go so first of all i just want to you know acknowledge some of the people that um that we lost uh this year and um you know up in the left hand corner we have jesse harvey he's from boston and and you know why do i have somebody from boston here because you know we actually got pretty close to the pandemic and uh he started the the first cert, the first church of safe injection and he was going to try to apply for a religious exemption to hand out safe uh safe syringes and drug te testing in the loxone kits um and and Maine um, or Massachusetts, uh, you know, like only public health um, authorities can give out safe supplies and it's illegal if you don't otherwise, but you can tell he went out in his red car every day and, and he did it. And, um, you know, this was a guy that was going places and, uh, you know, every time I, I hear somebody doesn't matter if I know them or not. I really feel something very strong, um, you know, and it, you know, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, you know, why, why them and not me. Uh, Jude Brind, uh, who is like the Mother Teresa of harm reduction advocacy. She's from Australia. Luckily, she didn't die of a drug overdose, but I thought it was good to acknowledge her and, and all the work that she has done. Uh, I recently wrote a piece for Filter on women who are leading uh, safe, the safe supply movement in Canada. Uh, and uh, I wanted to kind of put her in on it, but it just didn't really fit. So. I wanted to acknowledge her today, uh, and then this one up in the in the corner is probably the the hardest one that I uh, put up there. But I I thought I had to, you know. I'm still grieving over um, over Jesse. Jesse's the one on the your left, my right. Well, I guess my left now too. But um, he's uh, he's he's this guy here. 
he, you know, he, I've known him for quite some time. This was a day where we had Rock the Dock come down to Calm Good Solutions. We did some fundraising. You could see we had our disposal bucket. That's where we got all the money. And, you know, we did actually a really good job. And Jesse was really getting to, uh, he, he was getting it. He was trying his hardest. And, um, you know, I really believe that the absence based culture in Halifax killed him right like he uh he he tried to uh he 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 came off his opioid agonist therapy program and then he used again and his tolerance wasn't the same and um he didn't make it so back to the syndemic oh so the first syndemic was um and it's still going on, was the SAVA syndemic, the Substance Abuse, Violence, and HIV AIDS syndemic. And this would have been, you know, late 90s. Um, but as I said before, uh, the hallmark of the syndemic is the presence of two or more disease states that adversely interact with each other, negatively affecting the mutual course of each, each disease trajectory enhancing vulnerability and which are made more delirious by experience and inequities. So practically people living in poverty, people living with, you know, multiple uh, mental health and uh, social issues, uh, physical issues, they're all living in, in, in syndemics. And, you know, really COVID-19 is not a pandemic. It is a syndemic and we should be looking at it as one. So a big, uh, a big part of what I do at Kaput and Kaput is uh, a national drug user group. And we are an organization that was formed in 2009 unofficially officially in 2011 um we received uh funding in 2018 through the substance use and addiction program um with health canada um our whole board is made up of current or former people who use drugs. We don't have any non-drug users on our board. And I would say at least 80% of them are current drug users, including myself. Um, we do everything in English and French. This is one of our most, uh, most infamous documents. I actually would love to do a bibliometric uh, analysis and write a paper on how many times this has been cited in academic literature. Uh, but I learned a new trick where I can actually get a DOI number for so gray for gray literature. So that's what I'll be doing with some of our new material coming out. Um, but if you want the links to them or I can send out the slides and all our uh, all our material afterwards. But uh, so safe supply is not um, your traditional form of opioid agonist therapy. It's not methadone, it's not buprenorphine, it's not slow release oral morphine. You know, some may even argue it's not heroin assisted treatment. Um, safe supply is meant to be safe and it's meant to be taken home on supervised use, you know, we all know that drugs have um, consequences to them, but they have benefits and they have risks, but we speak so much on the harms that, you know, it debilitates re research, you know, it has this social perspective that just um, doesn't allow us to get to where we need to be to prove and show the evidence, even though I would argue there's tons of evidence proving that safe supply is a need and, and we need it yesterday. The states have 200 people a day dying, we have 14. That's a lot of lives. Um, 
the the definition we have in this booklet is safe supplies um, any any substance or drug that is traditionally uh, only found on the illegal market and um, we want to see a regulated supply now where drugs are still criminalized the safest and most direct route to a safe supply is through medical prescribing but you know i'm i'm someone who uses fentanyl daily and and a lot it's just i'm gonna cut it heroin compassion clubs this is another form of safe supply this is probably one of my favorite uh great literature documents um it was created by the bccsu um and a compassion club, I'm not sure if, what, if everybody knows what one is, but um, but a compassion club is, you know, like think about the, the medical marijuana days where everybody got together and, you know, backed each other up. They put all their money in, they pulled it up, they got a cheaper price, they got a better product. And we do that with heroin, you know, and not surprisingly, uh, it's mainly women who do this with heroin, right? Because a woman can't just go into a heroin assisted treatment program and ask for heroin if they have two kids, you know, or maybe if they, maybe if they're just not even a, a parent, but, you know, like the last thing we need is these evidence-based services and then CPS getting in the way and taking away children of uh, mothers that are just trying to stay alive. So a few safe supply initiatives and you may see some names here that are familiar. This is um, this is our older one. This, so this would have been our first draft of our securing safe supply during COVID-19 and beyond, scoping review and knowledge mobilization. Um, we have Matthew Herder and Sheila Wildman. We also, also have myself, Natasha Tuesnerd, who's the executive director of Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs, Michael Pugliese and Brianna Chang, and this project wouldn't have happened without them. Uh, Emily Camo. Uh, Claire Botkin, Dr. Claire Botkin, uh, Dr. Tommy Brothers, Dr. Leah Genge, um, Candice LePage, Aiden, Dr. Aiden Skeen, Dr. Dan Ware. So we have an inter international team um, and we're granted a CIHR knowledge synthesis grant to look at um, the scope to do a scoping review um, on safe supply. And we knew going into this that there wasn't gonna be a lot of literature on safe supply and we had to get crafty. And I'll, le I'll let um, Matt speak a little bit more to that. But if you look at the, the authors, myself and Natasha, the two drug users are the first two. And I think, um, you know, our team is, is the best research experience I ever had. And I feel very lucky to be able to um, to have been there, to have been a part of it from, from day one. And, um, you know, I don't want to jinx anything, but we have it under review at the International Journal of Drug Policy. And, um, yeah, soon we'll have a publication on this. Uh, another, oh. Another um, safe supply, um, I don't know if I'd call it a paper, I'd call it more of a guidance document. I want, I think like four national safe supply working groups now, but this one was done by Jessica Hales, Dr. Jillian Cola, Thomas Mann, Emmett O'Reilly, uh, Dr. Nanki Ray, Dr. Andrea Serrater, uh, Kaput actually was able to do an external review on this um, and they acknowledged it in the document. This is a policy options piece that actually me and my two panelists got to write. And if you see um, 
the title. It's uh, the expertise people who use drugs must be essential to the design of safe supply. And uh, there was a couple comments, kind of like, yeah, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think we're getting there. It takes a long time to change policy when we're trying to give free drugs to people that, you know, we will be there and we will get there. Um, I took the picture in the background. Those are um, the drugs we're fighting for right now, Dilaudid 8, the brand name. Uh, but if people who use drugs were not mainly involved, the quality of the research and its impact on policy and service delivery is likely to suffer. And Matt really did a um, worked his magic and, and made this to the piece that it was meant to be. And this is another piece that uh, I worked with Sheila on and. and I was in jail in 2018. I just got out of jail on March uh, 15, 2018. Time flies, uh, but it also feels like I don't know how much, I don't know how I got all this done in a short period of time. But uh, I'm somebody that's on methadone, been on and off methadone my whole life. And, you know, in one way, I was very lucky and very blessed because. Um, if you go in jail and you don't have a methadone script before you go in jail, you don't get methadone. It doesn't matter if you meet all the criteria for opioid use disorder, you just do not get started. And um, so I, I was on methadone, luckily, but every day I had to get strips, strip searched. So I had to strip down my bare skin uh, you know, I had to show people my genitals. I had to turn around, squat, cough, um, doing this while other inmates are across the hall in their cells being strip searched. Um, and, you know, I, I always think back and I think about how many of those inmates told me that they were at Shelburne, that they were at Waterville and that they did get sexually abused. So they're reliving their trauma every day, but they need it. They need this drug to feel comfortable in their own skin, yet they have to be re-traumatized every time they have to do it. So some knowledge translation products um, that came from, um, you know, a lot of the work that we have done like, lately. Um, this was one. So the, the policy options piece was a knowledge translation product that came from our CITR grant. Uh, this Canadian drug users need us doctors to step up with safe supply. That was another knowledge translation product. Um, safe supply doesn't just have to be uh, opioids. We need stimulants as well. Uh, one of our national CSSDP board members wrote that. Um, I wrote this piece on method dose. And, you know, if you listen to Crackdown and if you don't, you should because it's like the best podcast ever. But uh, essentially they uncovered um, a wrongdoing and from the BC government, the BC College of Pharmacists and Malin Prof Pharmaceutical that they did a switch and they called it the exclusive exchange where they said, you know, we'll give you methadose, but we want everybody that's on the prov provincial pharmacare that's on methadone, we want every single one of those clients. And this was back in like 2015, 2014, 2015. And it's spread across Canada, of course. And I remember like 2016, 2017, I was struggling. You know, I ended up in jail in 2017. And, you know, it was because my methadone wasn't working. You know, I couldn't, it didn't last me a whole night. And, um, now I'm starting to realize, you know, that, you know, some of the things I did weren't my fault. You know, like that should never happen. 
Um, I overdosed last um, uh, July. Um, I think the pandemic affected me a lot more than I thought it did. I think I held a lot in for a while. Um, and you finally wrote about it and it made me feel a lot better. Um, and, you know, ironically, I don't know, a month later, I responded to an overdose and uh, I'll stop touching my mouse. Um, I responded to an overdose and if anybody knows me and, and they see me with my book bag, I always have an oxone dangling from my bag. And this this evening, this guy never had a cat, never had access to a cat ever. We have no social take home naloxone program. He had no idea what that is. You know, like, ooh, why is that? You know, what's the Nova Scotia Health Authority doing? Like, you know, we have somebody who uses drugs daily and they have no idea about a take home naloxone program. It's a, it's a joke. Um, I gave him my last kit and I walked up to, to score some fentanyl with my friend and uh, I gave him a little bit of extra and he overdosed in seconds. I never seen someone go down so fast. I didn't have an oxone kit. I, um, you know, remembering all my harm reduction methods, I put him down on his back. I breathed in his mouth for geez, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, it was kind of surreal. I was like, somebody, there's probably about seven of us there. I'd say four people left right away. Uh, the owner of the host was looking for an lock zone. Some guy stayed with me. And, uh, you know, like, it was, I didn't think he was going to make it, you know, I really didn't think he was going to make it. I didn't have no oxone and I just, um, I don't know what I would have done if he didn't make it. And, um, but, you know, luckily we don't need chest compressions. That's a last resort. When you die from an opioid overdose, it's oxygen being cut off to your brain not um uh, you know you, we don't you know so the chest compressions would be the very 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 last resort so if you don't have naloxone you just do rescue breathing you know you put the neck back you, you hold your nose blow in your mo mouth and you can even kind of hear them breathe a little bit more each time and I saved your life doing that. So this is uh, the publication. I'm probably over time, so I'll try to speed it up. Um, a little bit of background information. Uh, I was just supposed to be an editor uh, to the letter, or an editor, a letter to the editor. Um, got turned down at the Lancet. Got a dream big. Um, and then International Journal of Drug Policy let us down really smoothly. And I wrote this other piece for the conversation um, just a little bit before. And I remember the Journal of uh, Studies on Alcohol and Drugs, they, um, they retweeted it um, and said how much they liked it. And I kind of said, oh, I'd love to publish in your journal or whatever. I didn't even know what kind of journal it was at the time. Um, and they said, oh, what's your email? We'll reach out. We'd love to have you. And I thought it might have been like a predatory journal, but it turns out it's through Rutgers, Rutgers University. It's the oldest academic journal focused on alcohol and drugs. Um, the editor and she said, can you take this letter to the editor, which was focused on safe supply and combine it with your decriminalization um, article and expand it into 2000 words. And um, I said, we sure can. 
Um, and so it really happened very organically. We got Dr. Mark Tyndall as our uh, senior author, which is really cool. Um, and we also put a land acknowledgement in there, which you don't always see every day. So I won't get into too much of, you know, the piece, I will share it. Um, but, you know, essentially, we argue that we're in, a, we're in a endemic, we're not in an overdose crisis. Um, and we need decriminalization and say supply or this is continue, it, it's going to get worse, you know, 81,000 people in the states died in 2020. Um, they're projecting a 100,000 and like, when is enough enough, right? Uh, decriminalization is always possible. If there's political will, you know, like, we just need a push for it. Um, and a safe supply of drugs, you know, the, the landscape in the states is a little different where the, the DEA actually controls all um, what doctors can prescribe and things like that. They're kind of like our Health Canada in a way, which is absolutely insane. I think we should sue the DEA. Maybe Matt and Sheila want to take that on, but uh, you know, like I really think they probably played more of a role in this overdose crisis than anybody else. Um, I don't know. Did I take out? I must. Uh, oh, so we had uh, we had three commentaries written on our piece. Um, one was from Stanford, one was from uh, Brownlow uh, in the University of California, and one was from Yale and, and Kathleen Carroll. Uh, rest in peace, she passed away suddenly this, this year. Um, and she did a lot, you know, like I mean, they didn't all agree with what we were saying, but I, I looked at her bio and she did a lot of work for this field, you know, and um, I respect that regardless if, if they're um, thinking what I'm thinking, you know, I think change happens when, you know, people have different perspectives and have an open mind uh, and they're willing to listen to each other. So the journal let us write another piece. They had all these crazy names like unsafe supply, why safe supply won't help. One was called use without consequence. And then there was another one like, let's put the, the unicorn before the horse or something. Or, so we used uh, a famous Bob Dylan quote the times are changing, addressing misconceptions of North America's uh, overdose crisis. And um, yeah, that was kind of like my, I stole this from Mark Tyndall. I seen him do it, I didn't sue, uh, but it is like one of my, my favorite um, Banksy photos. So keep your coins. I want change. I'd argue we need change. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Matt, for sharing all of that with us. And thank you for the work that you are doing uh, and you continue to do um, to trigger change. Thank you. Um, no we're now going to turn it to, to Matt Herger to uh, hear more about the work that, uh, that uh, the three of you are doing. Adelina, <clears throat> and thanks Matt for really setting the conversation up. I'll, I'll be brief just to give more time for discussion for folks after Sheila has a turn as well. Um, so just, just a couple of points I wanted to share with the group. Um, the first thing is uh, that you know, this was a, so we started working together, Matt and I had met um, maybe the year before 
Um, a lot of my work's been in drug policy, but I've tended to focus on drugs that have been approved for prescription purposes and you know how well the regulatory system is working. Do we really know if they're safe or not? And raising questions about you know some of the drugs that contributed to the overdose crisis, like oxycodone, um, and the way the poor decisions that I think Health Canada, the U.S. regulator, has made in in licensing those drugs. And so to to sort of come at this differently, to think where are we now, um, and what is actually the safest thing to do, and actually think about making some of these drugs that, um, at least in earlier work that I've done. Have great raised questions about why they were let on the marketplace, but to shift and think through, well, you know, there's a serious harm and a lot of that harm, if you really understand what's happening on the ground through talking to people like Matt and, and Natasha Kaput and many others, um, you, you, you see that if you don't know what's in the drug or the conditions in which you consume it are so deeply unsafe that making sure that you can at least remove one of those risks from the equation, right? Knowing the contents or composition of the drug, what its dosage really is, that it's not laced with something that you're not anticipating is so critical, or at least one piece of the puzzle in reducing the overall incidence of harm. But for me, it was a shift in my work because because of what I had done before and being critical about how some of these drugs had entered the market in the first place. So it was a really um, incredibly important opportunity for me to learn, if I can just put it in those selfish terms from experts like Matt, um, uh, you know, and so it's, it's been an incredible journey to be on. So I just wanted to say a tiny bit more about the research that Matt highlighted there when he sort of talked about us getting crafty. So we got one of these, you know, COVID grants uh, thinking about uh, people who use drugs and how to reduce harm. And this idea of trying to pull together all of the research that's out there around safe supply, which is this kind of emerging concept. You saw it in that document that Matt had up in his slides around safe supply that Kaput, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs, you know, they, they created this sort of groundbreaking document to sort of articulate what that means from a perspective of people who use drugs. Um, in its full scope, right? And it's a concept that physicians or people like me who've been studying the regulatory system in certain ways struggle to understand in a way because we're thinking about risks without necessarily attention to what's happening on the ground at times. Um, and so, so we got one of these grants to sort of say, well, what's the state of the knowledge? We're in COVID, it's harder to see physicians, it's harder to um, uh, uh, source drugs that you may need to use. Um, and so, you know, what, what, what can we learn from previous disasters or public health emergencies when people need medicines, need drugs, uh, but there are all these barriers for public health reasons, um, natural disasters, those kinds of uh, real world events that can shake things up. And so we pulled together, none of us had ever worked before. And it's really a credit to Matt and Natasha Kaput and other people who through the research process we involved in the research um, that really brought us together, I think, and pulled together because we saw the importance of the issues. But we were worried about this. So I know there's at least a few academics in, in the participants list, but others might be quite interested in this as well, or at least I hope you will be. We did something called a scoping review. And for a legal academic like myself, a scoping review, if I'm being honest, is kind of a fancy way of saying I'm doing a lit review. You just sort of make exactly what you did in the process of doing the research more transparent. You say, I looked at this many papers, here are the terms I used to search the literature. But to me, it seemed like a bit of a game, right? You're sort of making a big deal about your methodology, but it's actually about doing a really good literature review at the end of the day. But so that was the method we adopted because we figured we could pull together and see if there's important insights in the literature. But of course, we were worried about that too. We were worried about what the literature didn't show for a very specific reason, which is if we're trying to pull together the knowledge about how do you make drugs available to people who need them in the context of a public health emergency like COVID, well, if there actually isn't very much relevant literature, even drawing analogies to natural disasters or other kinds of medicines, um, then there's a real risk that we sort of reproduce the status quo, right? We generate this scoping review, this fancy literature review, which essentially says there isn't very much evidence about how to do this well. 
And that could feed into folks who have a hesitation or aren't yet persuaded that safe supply is the way to reduce harm. They might say conservatively, there's not enough evidence for us to act. So we need to study it rather than act. And so we actually messed with the methodology in our process because of anticipating that problem that a scoping review might actually just kind of feed into those conservative perspectives from our point of view. And so we structured our research process to try and um, account for that, uh, to account for the fact that the literature might be really thin and not help us that much. We did find literature, we searched a hell of it, a hell of a lot of it. <laughs> um, but we also built in an advisory committee um, that acted, acted like a consultant. So when we developed search strategies or we started to find relevant literature or things that we thought might be relevant, we would consult through Matt and Natasha in particular, uh, a group of people with living experience or lived experience, people who use drugs, about what we were seeing in the literature, what was missing, what was not there. Because if we didn't write, the kind of things that rise to the level of a publication in a medical journal may not actually match the insights, knowledge, and expertise of people who know what's happening on the ground. And so we were kind of messing with the method with a very clear understanding that the methodology might end up um, producing a document that doesn't tell us really much about what to do, given the scope of the syndemic that Matt talked about. So one of the things that I think we hope to do in the future is actually write about our process, that we didn't just do a scoping review or lit review as such, but we did it in this more inclusive way. Um, and that was this one of the central things for us. Like there's lots of research that happens in the university where people who have insights and expertise, but they're not part of the university are sort of tokenistically engaged rather than meaningfully engaged. And so it was really critical for us to try and counter that in our process and in the knowledge we actually produced. And we have to keep attending to that, right? We're sort of in the middle of this in some ways. Um, and, and so um, that's really important for us moving forward. So I just wanted to highlight that kind of process piece, um, but I'll turn it over to Sheila to say some more. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Both, uh, both Matt. Uh, that was uh, that was wonderful, and um, I'm just so pleased to have been able to be part of the research project that Matt Herter has just described and that Vaughn before him, um, and also a little bit of other writing that um, the three of us did in a policy options piece, and that um, Matt Vaughn and I did about a year ago now in um, a piece published in The Conversation, which I wanna talk a little bit about because for the few minutes that I'm gonna take, um, uh, I'd like to talk about um, some of the learnings or the insights that have come out of um, the work that we've done together. So across lines um, and in that, I mean the lines between conventional uh, academic researchers and folks with lived experience or street level um, expertise in the way that um, we've worked in the projects that uh, were just described. So that kind of work, that kind of working across lines really affects um, the kinds of questions that you ask, uh, the kinds of insights that you can um, you know, glean from whatever the material is that you're looking at, like Matt Herter's just described, and also, you know, thereby the kinds of policy solutions that um, you're likely to work toward. So, you know, we all come to research with <clears throat> bases of experiences and of values that affect, right, the questions that we ask and the kind of leanings that we have toward um, interpretation of the data. Uh, that we see, but um, as was just described, this was a very intentional um, way of bringing together different perspectives and uh, experiences in order to arrive at something that we hoped would shake up um, in some sense uh, the, the sorts of policy stasis that, that we've seen uh, for so long. So two things that I wanna talk about briefly. Um, one goes to uh, the harms of criminalization and incarceration. 
So I think we all recognize that there are harms to criminalization and incarceration of people who use drugs. And we're living in a time uh, right now, Bill C-22 is something that you know, is in the background here. We're living in a time where decriminalization of at least simple possession of drugs uh, is very close at hand, at least a form of decriminalization. But I, it's, it's so important to keep our eye on those harms. And um, I would go further, can't really develop this tonight, um, but I'd go further in light of the research we've done together um, and also uh, you know, recommend that we think very carefully about the harms of controlling forms of treatment. So controlling forms of uh, putative alternatives to criminalization and incarceration of people who use drugs. Um, that's very central learning for me in the work that I've done uh, with both Matt's. The first um, uh, insight comes out of the piece that Matt, one of the pieces that Matt Bond uh, showed, and it was written about a year ago, as I said, it was published in the conversation. It was called Fueling a Crisis and <clears throat> was a comment on uh, the opioid uh, syndemic as, as Matt uh, has described. And there were three things that came out of that that were really memorable to me. Um, and this was co-written also uh, with a, a physician in uh, uh, Ontario, Claire Bodkin. So first thing that we started with was a statistic. In fact, a few statistics, right, um, as one often does in research. And so we pointed out that opioid related deaths were increasing among incarcerated people. So inside prisons and jails. Um, but also uh, we pointed out a very disturbing statistic around uh, deaths post release. So we note, and we're you know, drawing on other research here that in the two weeks after release, a prisoner's risk of overdose is more than 50 times higher than in the general population. That's in the two weeks after release. And that one in 10 of all overdose deaths is a prisoner released in the last year. So pretty massive um, indictment of the way that uh, our, our system of criminalizing and incarcerating people who use drugs harms uh, those people. And in this case, we're talking about mortality. Um, and then second, we made a point, and this is now at the policy level, just to kind of focus in a little bit more. Uh, we um, highlighted a policy at one of our local jails here in Nova Scotia, uh, Central, Correctional, uh, uh, Central Nova Scotia Correctional Facility, um, which has a, a policy that's actually developed by our health authority, which looks after the health of folks incarcerated there. Uh, and one of their policy states that um, opioid agonist therapy uh, shall not be provided to those who were not in treatment in the community, so prior to their incarceration, meaning that unless you've been in treatment prior, um, you're not going to get OAT, which means you have to withdraw, which is a pretty harsh thing. Um, and it also means that folks are incentivized uh, to use illicitly inside, which is itself um, uh, harmful, it's very risky. Um, and the other side of this is that if you're not using inside, your tolerance is going down and this contributes to the risk of overdose when you're out. So that was kind of a second point. That policy is something that has sat kind of a, a target of lots of criticism for many years and it continues um, to sit there. Uh, and then third, and this comes out of Matt's contribution to that piece, um, some qualitative development and details about uh, the policy just described um, and other policies relating to receipt of opioid agonist therapy um, in jails. So Matt wrote uh, a paragraph that was very uh, personal, much like he, he just earlier um, relayed to you about the experience of strip searching, um, the, uh, you know, the humiliation and the potential uh, triggering of past traumas. Um, and he went further and described, you know, some of the systems people use to divert medication um, and so on. And just to read it, we ended up translating it to third person, right? But we, we kept those insights. He says, uh, I'm just reading uh, from the piece. Um, Others who want the medication to prevent their own withdrawal symptoms target prisoners receiving OAT. People soon start diverting their medication, for instance, by vomiting it up and straining it through a sock for someone else to use. 
If someone says no to a demand to divert their OAT, they may be subject to violence. So this piece, this insight that's written in the third person, it's a piece of research originated in a personal experience that we linked up, right, through our, our co-creation of knowledge in that piece that we linked up with the statistics, with the policy. But that qualitative development is central to the effectiveness of this piece. And um, I guess I'm gonna have to stop there, but that's meant to be just one illustration of the ways that um, the connections can be made uh, between, you know, kind of statistical and other population-based or policy-based uh, research and the really fine-grained insights of um, street level, or in this case, is institution level knowledge. Okay, I'm gonna stop so that we have a little bit of time for questions. Thank you so much, Sheila, and thank you so much uh, to the two Mets for this incredible talk. Uh, um, I don't even know where to start with uh, with the comments. I'd have a lot of questions to ask you, uh, but I do. We only have about four minutes left, so I do want to invite the people in the audience to ask if. Uh, uh, to see if they want uh, to to come on and ask questions or to type them in the Q and A, um, and uh, maybe in the meanwhile, while uh, while we wait for a question or two, maybe I'm curious how the three of you ended up working together on this. Like in, in particular, how come that uh, uh, you, Sheila and Matt, ended up working together with uh, with Matt Bond? Do you want me to answer this, or do you want them to answer this? Uh, why don't you answer it? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so Matt and I met at um, uh, HCV Summit, I think April 15th in 2019 that Martha Painter put on and I spoke and Dr. Lisa Barrett was there. Um, and we kind of just really clicked and at that time, the overdose prevention site was really kind of um, had a lot of momentum going. So Matt agreed to help uh, with that as well. So ever since then, we kind of been looking at something to work on. Um, Sheila, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, Claire reached out and asked if anybody wanted to write a uh, and I think we knew each other just from, you know, the community, Martha. but yeah, yeah. Um, but to work together, I think Claire reached out and asked if we, if anybody wanted to write an op-ed on uh, the issue about OAT and JL and Martha connected us all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which goes to kind of like this living in Halifax in this small community where there are so many interconnections really among like lots of different work being done by a few people, <laughs> but all really good people. Um, so I don't see any question here, but I do have one that is more my curiosity from your perspective as, as people who are not necessarily practicing in criminal law. Oh, we do have a question here actually. No, it was just a thank you. Um, so, you know, the, the big criminal justice bill that, uh, that's coming up and uh, Sheila, you have mentioned uh, you had me mentioned it in in passing, um, and there are there are lots of uh, discussion regarding increasing the police discretion in terms of uh, um, arresting drug users and uh, uh, making arrests for possession in particular, and uh, it has been hailed as being particularly transformative, as particularly uh, important as a as a um, as a piece of legislation. And I think that a lot of people agree that, you know, it is a step forward, but then again, um, it, others might argue that it's just tinkering at the margins with a much broader problem, right? So um, I'm wondering if you have any thought about, uh, if you're familiar with, and if, if you have any thoughts regarding, uh, regarding the changes that are being currently proposed uh, and that are gonna go uh, before the parliament. I think we have about one minute left. I don't. I don't know about the other folks, but the two things that that I would say about that, because it, you know, it removes mandatory minimums for for drug offenses, and it uh, uh, it doesn't eliminate the potential for prosecution of low level possession, as I understand it. But it does, as you say, it mandates consideration of alternatives, both on the part of police and prosecutors, and um, and so. 
uh, one of my questions goes to what those alternatives are likely to be. Conditional sentence, potentially. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of the critiques that's been raised around that is that the kinds of conditions that are imposed tend to be most likely breached by those who are already most marginalized. So you're talking about, you know, folks in poverty, folks who are, you know, um, indigenous folks who are racialized, most likely to breach those sentences and be back in jail. So there is a potential kind of intensification of, uh, you know, disproportionate representation through that. Uh, and the other thing that I'd say that's potentially a problem goes to treatment alternatives. And I just raised that as a as thought so far, but I, I think that it's something we need to think about. Um, coercive treatment alternatives are uh, something to be wary of. Uh, it's a great study, 2020 out of Vancouver and Matt, both Matt's relied on it in their uh, work uh, that showed no statistical significance to difference in substance use among those who are in coercive treatment versus those who are in non-coercive treatment versus those who are not in treatment at all. Um, and that's enough, I think, for us to really worry about of this, this kind of widening of the kind of uh, the you know, tentacles of uh, whether it be criminal justice or it be health systems into sort of controlling people's um, lives uh, on the basis of drug use. Just to piggyback off that, you know, the, the only alternative for criminalization is not criminalizing people for using drugs, right? Like, it's as simple as that. I know it's not as simple as that. But, you know, we don't have to put it into a health system. We don't have to wrap it with a bow and put it into like a rehabilitation system. We just have to stop criminalizing people. Um, you know, we're not trying to fix the healthcare system while we're trying to fix the criminal justice system at the same time. And if we are, then, you know, that's a, a whole different, you know, mandate, right? You know, there is a, a group that was announced, an expert uh, working group, a task force that's looking at alternatives to criminalization, but they're talking a lot about well, what are we going to do with them? Where we got to put them into treatment? And, you know, we continuously hear from people who use drugs. No, we don't, you know. But if somebody does want treatment, then it should be available. Matt, can I piggyback on your thought there? Um, and just, and Adeline, if we just have another minute or two, I know people might file out, but... Um, so I take your point, right? Like criminalization is such a harm, right? That to decriminalize is, is so critical. But when we think about access and what a safe supply look like, the question becomes how, right? How are we gonna make it available? And so I, I guess I wanna just, we've had this conversation internally before through our research and so on, but I'm like, I know you have lots of thoughts on like, well, so to decriminalize and making safe supply, what, is that like taking the model of cannabis and doing that? And I, we've talked about that before, or is it like, or what's happening with psychedelics, you know, cause they are going very commercial in a different way. I don't know if you want to expand and talk about the ways in which people use drugs are actually sidelined from those things. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think the Cannabis Act is a prime example of excluding people who use drugs from uh, their expertise, right? You know, if I want to buy weed from somebody, I want to buy weed from somebody who's been selling it forever and they know what they're doing. But we can't now because if you have a criminal record. I can see safe supply as kind of like a mixture of you know, because we went, we didn't decriminalize marijuana or, or cannabis, we went right to regulation, right? I could see some kind of like hybrid model of a legalized, like a regulation or sorry, a, a decriminalization with compassion clubs that are not criminalized or, you know, the government giving certain drugs to pharmacies and, you know, doing training and, you know, social enterprises where you could go and buy a drug, uh, you know, and I think really we should put 
safe drugs in the hands of drug dealers, right? I like to call them drug service providers, but, um, you know, they have probably the most access to people who need some of the most services out there. And I guarantee you, if someone had an abscess and they're injecting somewhere and all they want to do is get high, they're going to call their drug dealer before they're going to call Mosh. But if there's a drug dealer coming with Mosh, maybe there was a, you know, there's an intervention there to, to happen, right? I don't know if that really answers your question, but, um, you know, I think, yeah. I think through community-based organizations, needle and syringe programs, overdose prevention sites, like those are places where we could have drug service providers. Thank you so much. I think uh, we're going to have to conclude we're a few minutes uh, after um, the, the announced closing time, but uh, we, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to us, Matt, and thank you um, Matt and Sheila for your contributions tonight and thank you everyone for uh, for attending. Um, as I mentioned, this is the last event of the Criminal Justice Speaker Series. If you want to watch some of the other um, talks, feel free to check them out on YouTube on the Schulich School of Law YouTube channel. Um, and uh, with that, um, um, we are going to uh, stop here. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.